the first um, meeting when you guys came by, we had just kind of discovered all those possibilities, and we got there, and it was doing what we wanted. Yeah. And we were, it was new, so we were very excited about it. And then we came back this week, and we had those same three things, and we're like, oh, this again. Yeah, it was a new thing. And we yeah. tried to work further on it. Yeah. And in a place that kind of felt like, well, I don't know. But how does it feel like when you guys... Uh, because you guys are saying that you have other projects in between, and then you come back and you do the controller shows, and then you're like, you're working with old material again, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So is there, is there excitement again to play the old songs, or do you have to really motivate yourself back into it? Good question. I think there's excitement. Yes. I think we're really excited every time to come back. But the thing is, we were just actually talking about it a lot the last week. Uh -huh. We've... Um, We've discovered that the moment where our songs are the most alive, because of the way that we work and the way that the material is performed afterwards, the song is the most alive when you're in the process of writing it and defining the sound world and like putting everything together the way you want it to be. And then it becomes fixed. And there's still some levels of freedom inside it, but it's like it becomes this emotional uh, photograph of that period at that moment. And it will always be there in the catalog of emotional photographs that you can come back and pick it up and say like, okay, this is cool, and then do it again. But it's no longer a living, breathing... Yeah, the creation part is really exciting. So just going into the studio and making... And also for us, I think that's something that kind of didn't go through. We talked about with someone who wasn't in the presentation yesterday, but we talked. We, he asked how it was, and we said, well, it was complex. Yeah. And uh, we, we thought... He, he mentioned, because... We, for us, I think it was really the two weeks in the studio working together and making, kind of really making the dough of this new material that made it so such an amazing experience for us to come here, and that we felt didn't come through in the presentation. And for us, that was actually what made it such a, a great thing that we could take that space to make this together, and uh, that it feels like it can from now on. Okay, we can formulate it into a more um, familiar working environments or into a more familiar sound, but it really was about coming here together and making this snapshot of this current time in our life, also musically, uh, and also the stuff we just went through because we've been through like, a crazy period. So going into the studio, having to face each other and work together was really, it, it was very inspiring. It was really hard, but that was actually what it was about. So the glove, of course, that was a very important part of it, but it was just Details. a part of it. It was in a more, you know, I, I don't want to say spiritual level, but it was in a more existential level of uh, just working together and, uh, and making this. Also, I think for us it was, you know, pushing the borders of the, the band as we've defined it. You know, in the beginning, we had a very clear idea, like, we want to make those three songs and we want to do it like that. <laughs> and then we just did it, and without thinking about it. And, then we released an EP and we got a lot of feedback from the EP that, you know, there's a one song that goes here, another song that goes here, another song, and it's like four different possibilities where that band could develop to. And then we had another process, intense writing period, where we kind of honed in on a certain direction. And that was actually just in September, August and September. And already, those songs were the ones we played yesterday and said those are the old songs. Because they don't represent us really anymore. I mean, we still love them and they're great, but it's, we're just moving forward. <laughs> okay, so um, I'll, I'll be asking some questions. Mm -hmm. um, if you could, as much as you can, repeat the question at yeah. the beginning. There's something that you wanna? Um, so first question, how many Zobin panels are in Studio One? <laughs> 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 um, so, <laughs> yeah. so first, um, if you could just tell me your name, your, and um, yeah, tell me who you guys are. Go ahead. I'm Thomas Mermel. I'm Anat Spiegel. And together we made this band called Controlar one and a half years ago. Mm -hmm. And we've slowly been developing a way of performing electronic music in a duo setting. We're trying to really get to the level of performativity in that. And in order to do that, we found this instrument called a P5, which is a, a video game controller for the hand, a three-dimensional tracking device. And we tried to use that to control the electronic elements of the music, and then another and I are singing. Okay. 
I, I sing more. <laughs> Tell me. Scream. I'm not just singing, <laughs> I just mumble along. Can you tell me a little bit more about the music, the style, or the, the sort of music that you're trying to do or express? Um, I think when we started, we had this concept of pop in our heads. Since we're coming from a background of, uh, of modern music and music theater and jazz, actually, um, we want to do something poppy. Um, we kind of succeeded to some extent. Uh, now I think it's kind of experimental pop with a lot of those other influences that we come from. Uh, at the moment it feels more experimental than pop, but I think it's... It goes back and forth. We're sitting forth. on that border, but it also it's the idea of this kind of sinister pop using a lot of uh, 80s synthesizer, a lot of uh, sounds from very early electronic music in the pop world where people are still experimenting with what they were making and, and what it could be. Yeah, we try to make it not too neat and not too clean and an to have an raw. element of rawness and of nostalgia at the same time. To have a That's actually um, something that uh, someone mentioned at a concert of ours once that they, they normally categorically hate electronic music and they said that because the element of like melodic song or dramatic song that was here in, present in our songs, they said they could really, really enjoy it. It was like listening to electronic music that wasn't electronic music. And uh, that was a big compliment for us. Yeah. And uh, can you tell me how, um, how you make music together? Um, how, what, what's, okay, let's say uh, before you came this time, what was the sort of the way you guys work together and uh, those songs are composed? Um, normally, to write songs, we would each go to our computers and uh, formulate an environment within Ableton Live uh, in which we can, yeah, work. So, so uh, sometimes we write things out. And I think for me it was a lot of intuitive putting things together in a layered fashion and then going back to the piano and trying to figure out melodies and text. We used to always exchange uh, stuff, but it was quite an individual process. It became very much like one person behind the computer. When we originally started writing songs, we started in this way that one of us would take a sketch and start to develop it inside of Ableton Live. And then we would give that sketch to the other person and then, or sit behind the computer together and listen to the sound world. And because the, what we were writing was actually the sounding result, we could really dive into the details of like there has to be an extra bass drum hit here or there has to be... So we were actually producing the songs before performing them. While writing them, them yeah. yeah. And, and... Go ahead. Um, and can you tell me uh, why you're at Stein? Um, we... Why, yeah, so yeah. Why, why did you guys apply to Stein to work here? We, we originally um, talked about applying to Stein because we realized that we had come as far as we could in the process, in the way that our, the dynamic of our band worked. We wanted to find a way to go further. And our original uh, hypothesis about the way to go further was to develop an instrument for a knot so that she could also control the electronic elements of the music. So then we would have more of a kind of an even... Um, presence on stage and there's since been a lot of talks about whether that would be good or beneficial or not and I think ultimately we did come to the conclusion that we would like to create some sort of instrument for a nut but something that would be different than the, the glove. Um, so the original goal was to come and build an instrument for me. We realized in the very early stage before even getting in that it it's probably not the best way to go about it right now. But also there's this guy at Stein Takuro who really <laughs> made it very clear to us that actually we have a lot of different elements and a lot of different levels in the band that we could work on and that Stein could also support us in. And it didn't necessarily have to be building another glove. And th that was really actually uh, eye-opening for us because I think we were on a very different track with the process and uh, the fact that, we, that there was no chance for a glove because it, it was really right actually, that it wasn't the right time uh, for a glove because we didn't really know yet how deep we can go with that 
one glove that we have. So in fact, what it became about is really going deep into the compositional process, into writing together and really collaborating for the first time in a very democratic fashion. And, uh, and to try and develop the and performativity of electronics with the materials we already have. Really dissecting uh, what the glove is good at and how do we interact with the glove in a way that makes sense to us the most and trying to um, expand that as much as possible and, and get to new different sonic results through that and a chance of working together uh, yeah. in a much more profound way so it's much as individual and we had to face each other in the generation of the sound and the material from the really very basic level so that was really it was really good really fantastic I think also it wouldn't have been possible a year and a half ago when we started this band I mean when we started we were really on the same page as far as what we wanted to hear and what we wanted to make but we lacked the common knowledge that after doing this for a year and a half together we've kind of built a very clear aesthetic choice I think even without being able to really define it in words very well we both know like when we're looking at I don't know, the MS-20, and we're trying to figure out like what is the right bass sound we want, and then we hit the right like um, VCO envelope, and then we're like, ah, that's, that's how it has to be. And then we both agree on that, and that's really, that's a cool place to be. Yeah. I think some of the um, interesting conversations we had while you were here was this, um, this almost a separation in uh, styles, and because you guys come from different backgrounds, doing contemporary music, jazz, or improvise, or theater, but being also very interested in more popular music or sequence-based music. Mm -hmm. um, if you could tell me some of your thoughts about how these could cross, or some of the challenges you face of you know, bringing these different backgrounds mm -hmm. together to make um, sort of more structured music. Yeah. Um, Shall I say something? Go ahead. Um, I had a thought, it went away. So remember to repeat the thing. Yes. Mm. I think the main issue with making this kind of crossover between those different genres of that are our background and something that is more popish or more polished or more sequenced is that for, I think the first thing is a more, much more conceptual level that for us it, do, it doesn't feel like a crossover. It feels completely genuine and that's the music we hear in our heads and I feel like for the audience it is something that's hard to swallow still. It's always a bit of a challenge and for us uh, this, this feels like that's the music of our lives in a way and uh, that we want to hear more of this kind of music. So in that sense I never felt like we need to bring world number two and world number three, the jazz and the head and dance music, the, the contemporary music together to, to a place where it can meet pop. It always felt this is what we hear, this is all part of this collage, and that collage is the music of our lives. And so that's one thing. And in this specific process with the glove, we did face uh, in these two weeks the fact that we are working in a very sequenced environment normally when we come to generate material and now when we started working in a different manner with the glove we realized we can open and stretch up the environment much more it's not so sequenced it's not so working on a timeline so it gives us a place to improvise a bit more and to challenge the sound a bit more in a place where originally we didn't even think about it we didn't even consume the possibility that it's possible is that absolutely. a good start absolutely <laughs> Do you have any, anything to add? Uh, I think mm, it's, it's funny for me to think about our backgrounds and to think about where I come from musically and where Anath comes from musically because all of those elements, they, they influence the output of the things that we make. And it happens also when I'm really writing contemporary music or when Anat is writing, you know, music theater. Like, it really happens that everything that, that you've listened to, all the David Bowie albums and all the Bob Dylan albums and all the Boulez albums, like, it all comes together in this weird way that you find your own element in each of those that you like. And I think that's the, 
the funny thing about calling you know pop music or experimental music like when when I say experimental music, what I imagine in my head is going to be different from every other person on the face of the planet. And when I say pop music, there's some element of music which I think that's pop. And when I want, want to write a pop song, then it will be like that. And for I think 80% of the population, that has nothing to do with pop at all. But uh, yeah, I think we really try not to deal too much with the genre and we're trying to concentrate much more on just what we want to make. And yeah, I think it confuses most people. I, I want to point out that I, f I feel like it's a bit of a trend actually, like looking around, meeting people and talking about music and being involved in a bunch of stuff. That there's so much more... I think we're still looking for genres and we're still looking for ways to label stuff because we are so flooded with so much information and with especially musical information these days. But at the same time, you see people who just generate material that comes from so many places at the same time that you really cannot... You, any, any real definition will actually miss the point. And, uh, and I feel like this is you know, the 21st century. It's really exciting to to be a part of it and claim that we're making experimental pop, I have no idea, I don't care. And, uh, and I feel like when we say experimental pop, we are limiting our audience. And I feel generally we just want people to come and hear what we do because I think there's a communicative element in it that, that uh, is very musical in so many different ways. We had some great experiences in America getting uh, a gig in a random venue outside of Washington, D.C. with a bunch of heavy death metal bands. Do metal night. Yeah, and, and, and Kosla. <laughs> and so you open with that one band with the guy who takes the microphone and he goes like, <laughs> and it just went on and it was really intense sound and those guys are making so much energy and it's like, and all the audience just pushing against the stage and totally into it. And then we get on the stage, we all go down and get a beer. And then one guy comes up in our first song and he's looking at us and then he runs back downstairs and then all those people come back up and they're all standing there for 40 minutes just like this. They just didn't know what to do. And I think that's really, for us, it was something really, we're very proud of the fact that that can work. That it doesn't matter if you're into doom metal or it doesn't matter if you like listening to bluegrass. Like, you see quality and you appreciate it. And yeah, People I don't know felt if, like they if saw quality us there is, is the right word even. I feel like uh, sometimes, especially with uh, with live performance, I don't want to say authenticity. With live performance, uh, I feel you uh, you can feel something uh, and you can connect uh, in, in a way that is very intuitive and is exactly not anything we can define. And it's great if we can do it. I don't think we can always do it. I don't think we can do it with everyone. But uh, whenever it happens, you know, it makes you understand that all this labeling actually, you know, who is it for anyway. So. Yeah. No, I, I think it's a, it's a very interesting point how there's so many labels and experimental music has become a label. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if you think of experimenting itself, yeah. it should be, you know, just cross, cross yeah. genre. Yeah. Um, and I think you guys sort of uh, represent that very well, that you had a very intense time at Stein sort of taking it as an experimental platform. Yeah. But then the music itself, that experimentation was for the generation of the music, yeah. and not to make a certain kind of music. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. um, that I, I want to add real quick that that was actually, it is one of the reasons that uh, this two weeks in time has been so valuable for us, because normally when we have an intense control our working period, it's with a deadline of, there's a concert coming, we need some new material, or we want some new material, and we have to prepare it and put it on stage. And here it was really, because we didn't have a concert at the end and we didn't have this kind of deadline pushing us towards a goal, we were really able to say, okay, let's just see what we can work on and really give the space and time to do that. And that was really valuable. I also loved the way it was made here that we had the, the two weeks were divided in the middle, so we had some time in between. And at the end of the first week, week, we had just a very, very tiny presentation for just a few people. The, the feedback throughout this whole thing was amazing because we, we had very little interaction, in fact. 
but every time we met, there was so much to think about and so much to work with, and we never felt like we were just thrown in the wind of you know just being buried in the studio and not knowing what to do. Of course, it was very confrontational because we had to figure it out, but uh, there was this very specific kind of guidance that I, I thought was fantastic because it gave us so much freedom, but at the same time gave us such good points to departure from and to work towards. So I think that's like a high five to, to you and, and to time for allowing this because it's, yeah. uh, it's exactly the right amount of you know pulling and pushing when you come as an artist to work in such an environment. So it's great. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, yeah, maybe Thomas, you could give us a little demonstration of the glove. Sure. Um, you want to Um, what exactly? I just play some things, or do um, you want me to give kind of an explanation of how it works? Um, not, not so much about the, the I guess, technique. It's more yeah, about the sounding. Yeah, like how, and how you use it. Um, um, like, yeah, play some sounds, and then, or I'll just explain. Yeah, how you use it in your performance. Yeah. And then, um, like, very lightly on how it works. Not yeah. so much about, like, no technique. Yeah. yeah. This is the P5 glove with the antenna and the glove with some infrared uh, LEDs to help follow my hand in space. And what I'm doing is um, running a bunch of soundtracks in a program that I can manipulate by moving my hand in space. And what we're trying to do is find a way to correlate these hand movements in space with the sounding result in performance, much the way a guitar player or a saxophone player, when you see them perform on stage, there are some inherent movements in the way that they uh, transmit that music in a performance that you as an audience member, you read those movements and you interpret them as subtext to the musical layer that you're listening to. So we're trying to find the same thing with the glove. Now it's kind of hiding behind more stuff, but uh, the goal is ultimately to kind of get the stuff out of the way and that it can really just be performing like this. So I have different sounds that I can play. Oh, when the speakers are on? Or can well, I, I, was, uh, I can turn it on. I don't know when this the mixer is on. That's on. Oh yeah, the mixer is down. That's okay. Like 
simple bass tones. tried not to and when we tried when we had tried to work together it was not really disaster no, we worked together <laughs> we, we, when we first met we worked together in a collective with uh, five other people that collective eventually became three people we made a piece with those three people and it was a really intense process and it was really like dragging ourselves through the blood and dirt every day for a month and we finally made it and it was very happy we made one more project like that and then we took like a two-year break from working together I think not officially but it just kind of happened that we decided we're gonna do our own things for a while and uh, that was the thing also when you work with your partner like if it's great it's really great yeah it's really awesome it's like you are in your own little universe and it's you, you against the world and it's gorgeous things. but uh, but it doesn't work it's <laughs> it's a bit. There's no way out that you're like in your you trapped yourself in your own prison that you built for yourself, and uh, yeah, it can explode inside your own head. Yeah, we we tried to now because the band you know gave us so many more ways of uh, working together, and uh, because we work also in different fields still, like we try to incorporate each other's skills also because yeah. we both grew as musicians a lot. Uh, so, you know, when, when I need an electronic musician, I would turn to Thomas first. And when I need project. a singer, I always hire so, a lot because uh, and she's we just do the best singer I know. And we do somehow end up working together a lot uh, in different formations. Uh, that's the most intimate one, Controlar. Uh, I think Controlar is for us, like, that's the... We kind of found our reason to be. You know, we uh, kind of said that is what we want to do. And it, it created kind of a strange... Um, situation because in the last 10-15 years we both wanted to make contemporary music performances or perform jazz like generally this kind of weird side world of contemporary music that was what we wanted to do and all of a sudden we were doing it and then we just decided that we wanted to make a pop band and I think it gave us so much more freedom because yeah. we um, because we have this little baby uh, that we really like and it's so portable and easy to move around and easy relatively easy to get gigs if you compare it to anything else uh, that we do. It's very lightweight. And yeah, we don't need funding to, I mean, it would be fantastic to have funding for this, but we, we manage to not need to be supported by any governmental Which means <laughs> uh, that we're doing contemporary music performances and music theater and all those other Take all the money from that. As our day job <laughs> and it. using it to support our pop band. But it, it gives us a fantastic amount of freedom because I feel like when, when we built this uh, band, and we created for ourselves a way out, in a way, from uh, this kind of overly intellectualized, too little people, Government too subsidized. less intuitive connection with the audience environments that we were working in before. And I feel like in that sense, we also managed to change those environments a bit because we come with a different consciousness to yeah. them. And uh, it's all connected to what we talked about also before, like the this non-genre But it's, it's a movement that we see happening around us a lot more, you know, contemporary composers or musicians who are also realizing that they won't be 
excommunicated if they're also performing in a pop ensemble or if they're performing in a, a big band, you know, playing just good hits. And like that, that kind of movement is becoming more and more common. We are the the people aren't getting dragged outside and getting and shot because they put a major triad in their piece. You I know? still it's, think in the general sense, I don't think you will feel it. Like you still go to a contemporary classical uh, music concert and you will get the same type of audience, the same type of... Um, yeah, attitudes. I but don't know. I, I think you feel it a little bit. You feel it a bit. And it's nice to feel. Yeah. But it's a bit. Are there, are there groups or contemporaries that you feel close to, particularly to this project? Are there inspirations? Or? God, we've been searching and searching and searching for a good set of role models for this. And it ties for us also into a, a lack of scene. I think that's. As much as we like the the sort of one foot on each side of the fence right now with the contemporary music world and the pop music duo that we have, we really miss a sense of community around that. And we, we've kind of uh, decided that there isn't really a pop music scene in Amsterdam, which I think, on one hand it can be true, on the other hand I can't help feeling like, yes, we're just too lazy to go out and find it now, you know? We spend so many hours in theaters and venues, like the last thing we want to do on our night where we're not in a theater or a venue is go to another theater and venue to see a band that might be good, and it's becoming a little too much, so... But we are trying. We would we love to have a scene. And, uh, and now we're going to collaborate, actually we're going to collaborate with a bunch more musicians that come from, from contemporary music background. So, we are not really popish yet, but uh, in, in, uh, it's really going to be great to introduce some live musicians into the setup, and we're really looking forward to that and seeing what. But we can if do. you have any suggestions about music which gives a, an idea of this kind of, um, if we dare say, crossover into those worlds, we're, we're like we're searching like crazy right now. Yeah. So we we've been we'd love to hear about it. And you guys are both um, foreigners living in Holland, but having living as professional musicians, uh, I think a lot of people around the world can be very sort of jealous um, <laughs> of this lifestyle. There, there are problems here, there are things about Holland. Um, but can you tell me a little bit about what your experiences are working as musicians in, in the Netherlands? Um, why, why do you guys decide to choose this as your base, um, and yeah, can you talk about that? Well, I came here uh, because I understood at a very early point that uh, the Netherlands was utopia for contemporary music. Um, I was studying music in the US where, like studying classical composition, and in the counterpoint classes, they would, professors would say like, yeah, parallel fourths, I mean, it can happen sometimes. And I felt like there's, in America, this whole think outside the box element, which I grew up with. So I have that very strong, like, as long as you find a creative solution and do whatever. And I really wanted to get a bit more of like a kind of fundamental, traditional, this is the way it's done and you cannot do it any other way. And so I came to Europe for that. And actually inside of the whole spectrum inside of Europe, I think the Netherlands is quite far removed from that. but. Still to this day, I think it's utopia. I mean, when it comes, it's it's changing. There's of course issues, and but the fact that like a month ago I was sitting in a debate with the biggest people in music theater and the Netherlands funds for the podium kunst, and everyone was sitting and discussing about well, who are the young makers today, and what do they want from the big institutions, and how can we find a better collaboration between the big institutions and the young makers? And I was thinking like. Everyone is complaining about how it's not working, but you know, if I was living in America, I could never be sitting in a discussion like this right now. It just wouldn't happen in the United States. Or in Israel. <laughs> Where we had a choreographer friend sell her car to make a piece, I mean. Um, yeah, it's, uh, I think we both come from countries who have a very specific appreciation <laughs> of culture. Um, and uh, yeah, we came here to study, and I think the reason we stayed and made this our base is sort of, it kind of happened, actually, by mistake. Yeah. It never was a conscious choice. 
and it becomes harder and harder to live the more we spend time here. We have a great uh, musical network and social network. And we are surrounded by super creative, fantastic people from all over the world. And there's something very intoxicating about that. Uh, and at the same time, it feels manageable. It's not a huge city that uh, takes a lot of energy. And sometimes I feel we both miss that pulse of a city yeah. and a place where you can get lost and feel a bit more raw. Like this is a bit too idealistic in a sense. And it's like utopia. I mean, yeah. utopia is that thing that, you know, it exists, but it doesn't exist. So you're here and you constantly feel like you're a part of this thing and in this thing and it's really amazing, but at the same time, this thing doesn't really exist. So you're kind of in this non-existent transitory... So we're still talking about where to go and how to go and if to go. When um, to go. But, you know, we... It's exactly what you said, a lot of people around the world hearing that we are people from another country living in Holland, making our lives as musicians. This is something that we would be jealous of living somewhere else. So it's it's very intoxicating and it's hard to, to let go. Maybe, you know, one day we become so rich it wouldn't matter anymore. Then we'll stay in Holland just like uh, all those bands who are registered in the Netherlands to evade the taxes. Yeah. We're still quite broke. Yeah. As musicians, but but we somehow manage and, happy and broke, uh, and, uh, and it's really great. I guess um, this will be my last question, but um, <clears throat> you know, for a lot of people to continue making music or to continue being an artist is a struggle, um, and there is something um, to it that makes you do it. And you guys were also talking about sort of the, maybe some sort of spiritual aspect while you were at Stein, mm -hmm. but maybe you could tell us like what what is it about music or what makes, what drives you guys to continue making the music or continue challenging yourselves uh, with these different projects? Hmm. Tell me about that. Um, I think that I'm in the best profession in the world, really. And uh, it's so exciting to perform for people. And, uh, and to communicate in such a way. Uh, there's nothing else that's like that. It's just amazing. And uh, I think that's the reason for me to do this, because it's such a high. And being involved with uh, so many people who are so creative and trying to define ways of relaying their reality to others, and the, it's just such a fantastic way to live. So as long as I can, I will go on doing this. And the more intense, bring it on. I mean, this is it. this is it for me. This is what I like to do the most. You? You said it. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of how to explain that. I just. <laughs> I have to make music, I guess. And um, I love going through that shit. Like, it's very uh, a sadomasochistic relationship with making music. It's something really great and really painful and really exalting. And yeah. Yeah, there's those, those moments of discovery, I think, with the band, we had that a lot. Those moments of discovery of sound or when you dig and into this it. one thing for days and then all of a sudden you figure it out and then that is just gorgeous and it's, it's like trapping the shadow of life inside of a capsule you know you know you can't actually hold it in there but for that split second it's there and that's really uh, it's great and it happens on stage and it can happen in the process of, of creating and uh, I feel like we're getting quite a lot of it for an average person because we are doing this, because yeah. we are doing music, so yeah, it's very addictive. It's really, really, and that, yeah, that's the thing. The more you do it, the more you get the the hang of it a bit. The more you just want more of it, so you're never gonna stop until you have to. Yeah, I don't see myself doing any like right now. I've been doing this for too long to do anything else. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit limited also, probably in that sense. But that makes us go on. I think. Um, High five. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. All right. Guys. That's great.
Thank you. That's a good question. <laughs> No, I mean, uh, we're, we're, still, we're still trying to figure out what the audience for what yeah. this is. Yeah. Um, and I think the technical parts are, are interesting for some people, but I also think, sure. like, it's, it's more interesting for people to know, like, how me, what musicians are going through. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. yeah. uh, I know so many people who stop music mm -hmm. because yeah. of this anxiety and like, yeah. thinking about work and money. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating, actually, how many people, like, I remember when I was going to the conservatory and there was really a mentality, actually a very unhealthy mentality that developed of, like, the people who failed or who couldn't cut it, like, yeah. they couldn't hold on because it was too stressful and the two odd hours and everything, and actually, you know, it's it's really just a personal choice, like, yeah. what it's you just, want it's to It's just like. a matter of, sometimes, chance that you end up... In the you know that you end up doing it while other people end up not doing yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. yeah totally. It's not the good and the bad. It's just the thing it is. So uh, let me know about the shows. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Takuro, are you ever playing with other people? I do, um, but I don't really do that much sort of like re session. Yeah. yeah. Unless it's like just a. Game. And yeah. Um, I like to play with people that we kind of like rehearse together and make a thing. And um, I don't really compose, but mm -hmm. I like the idea of having like a common a structure, yeah, structure a and, form, yeah. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, structure is good. Yeah, because with improv, improv stuff, when you play with somebody new or you just do these sessions, I feel like they kind of end up in similar structures. Yeah. And yeah. Also, as a player, you kind of end up doing stuff. Yeah, you it's feel like of, you're kind of recycling on your vocabulary yeah. because you yeah. don't get that push to go somewhere. Yeah. And it's, unless it's people that are really inspiring. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really hard also, even really inspiring people depends so much on the situation. That's why I never, I find, I always wanted to do like free impro stuff and I did it for a while and then you're like, okay, this is not, this is not really it because you want, you want to create a musical product that really carries yeah. and yeah. it so de depends on so many factors. It's not half of them I don't really like. Yeah, you know? yeah. And I'm, I've never been in a band. Um, okay. And uh, I am pretty curious about this idea of doing something that um, you're supposed to do. Yeah. Because I, there, there's probably a high there too. Yeah. To do it well, to execute things well. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I do have ideas about, you know, formulating some sort of group. Yeah. With, like pretty strict. Yeah. Ideas. But uh, that hasn't come yet. What would you put in your group? Like what, Djembe. what kind of? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Steel drum. Yeah, I can't. A rapper. A rapper. Yeah, <laughs> yeah either it would be like based off of some like Sun Ra, like nice. famous yeah. <laughs> kind of thing, or it would be like like a hip hop group. Nice. <laughs> Should be both. Hip hop? No, I think hip hop is actually what would be really cool is if you take those kind of Miles Davis things. And you make them kind of interludes in between the hip hop yeah, yeah. tunes. Yeah. We had actually for the show we were going to do in the Biennale, we had this idea because of the changing of presets and stuff of making like songs and then making interlude like small electronic sketches which would just kind of go yeah. while switching to the next song. Yeah, yeah. And then we were thinking like how it can lead from the beat at but the end of this song to that the song. songs are so complex. It's too overwhelming. Sonically <laughs> that it just would be such a pain in the ass to listen to all this music yeah, all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It has to be it's really, really delicate uh -huh. things to, to work. But it's still an idea I really yeah. like. But I think it's very challenging for an audience. But it can be really cool if you have, you know, like a hip hop tune is really like straightforward, that's what it is. Yeah. And then you switch to this 30 seconds of something completely out. And then all of a sudden you come back <laughs> and then you get a minute and a half and it's like... It's a mindfuck. It can be really cool. Do you, do you, uh, Thomas, do you play an uh, I used to play trombone. Okay. Um, but I haven't actually literally touched trombone, I think now in like three years. Okay. And... It's something that I can imagine doing again, but, no. <laughs> but we'll have to see how well, you, that... You study composition. I yeah, I started with trombone, because I was a jazz trombone player in the US, like playing in big band and jazz combo and that whole thing. And um, 
then I kind of got more into like writing arrangements for the big band and then I was like, yeah, I have my own ideas, I write stuff and then I wanted to get into composition lessons and I ended up in Amsterdam really like contemporary composition and jazz trombone performance. And those two majors, like they really, I don't know, they just hate each other. They just, <laughs> the, the directors of each department made sure that I always had classes scheduled for both at the exact same time <laughs> and they were unchangeable and there was nothing I could do and why the fuck was I studying that other thing anyway? So finally I had to drop one and I wasn't a very good trombone player to begin with so it was easy to let that go. And now you're, st you're doing jazz? Yeah, I, I studied, I came here to study vocal jazz performance Yeah, and I really wanted to be like a jazz singer. When I came I really wanted to sing proper jazz. You still do that? No. No? I think I, think I haven't sang jazz for since I finished school. No, but you, when you're teaching, you're singing jazz. Like yeah, I'm teaching. And of course, I mean, you can always hear that. You, know, yeah. you can always hear my background. It's very strong, I it's think. It's really strong. <laughs> and, but uh, I, I think I've done so much more uh, contemporary music, contemporary classical stuff, and uh, this stuff. And I did a bunch of free improv. So, I, like, really uh, earlier in the process, like, I think, second year I already had a crisis with like not really understanding I never could find material to sing and it felt like not not connected to the time and the place and yeah. then I started writing music to be able to kind of perform my material and I really got interested in the, in music theater and other stuff like yeah. and uh, the cross sectors of uh, things and dancing also did yeah I did dance movement I did all kinds of weird oh. shit <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, so we come from this really Okay. Always, uh, was always complicated with just with sticking to one genre. Yeah, I think. yeah. And what I loved again, it's really this element of nostalgia uh, mm -hmm. in jazz. Mm -hmm. I never liked the new stuff, you know. I always mm -hmm. liked what you play yeah, in your yeah. DJ sets. It's like that. That's my time, you know. Yeah, yeah, Hard yeah. pop and, and a little bit beyond that. And that's yeah. what I liked, you know. That's what I loved, and I couldn't find it in contemporary jazz. It's just a dead thing, you know. It doesn't <laughs> live. It's funny how like contemporary music has become. A genre, yeah. yeah. Contemporary music yeah. It doesn't represent contemporary. Yeah. And so jazz has become like what they call jazz today. Yeah. yeah. Is just like I mean, jazz itself was always about innovation. And yeah. Innovation yeah. Exactly. And now. And now it's this mundane like. Yeah. And you repetition. wonder what like Coltrane would think that he is being taught. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Like students studying. Yeah. And you know, in the pop. Academy. Ac academy here in, oh, in, uh, in the, the conservatory, conservatory opened a, a pop department. Oh, really? Yeah, yes, they you teach can pop come lessons. And, and learn how to write pop songs. Really? It's, yeah. uh, it's like three years old, four years old department. And they're All doing very well, of course, because it fits oh. the trend, you know. I mean, there's so, and it's amazing because you meet all those 18 year old kids that are like, they got their studio financiering and their parents are happy because they're in, you know, the School. conservatory and they're doing something with their life and they're like standing outside smoking a cigarette, like, man. That that pick you gave me, like it doesn't really play real good on the on the what the the <laughs> bottom string, you know. And all the conservatory kids are, who are there with their violins, they just look at those kids and they hate them. Like you see <laughs> hatred in their eyes. Yeah, but this is so complex at the same time, you know. It's great that people can go someplace and yeah. you know learn music, but at the same time, you're like, why, how? It's uh, very, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> it's very strange. It's very strange. Um, yeah. The institutionalization of those things is really yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Fascinating. Yes. And yes. I'm, I'm sure Hip Hop Academy yeah, probably yeah. exists yeah, somewhere yeah. already. I'm sure DJing will be part of Oh man. I mean, even in Israel, there's a DJ Academy now. Yeah. Like you can so learn how to become a DJ. Okay. Very it's handy. It's bizarre. <laughs> diploma. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You gotta have a diploma. That's, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you don't have a diploma. No, I don't. I, I, I refused it actually. Yeah. I, uh, did my end, for my end exam from composition because just like in that like I was always fighting against the institution where they're saying like you should write music and I was saying I'm going to make a piece with dancers they're like you should write music I said I'm going to make this electronic installation which has something to do with the music and they never understood what I was doing and they half the there was always very split like half the department wanted to kick me out of school and the other half the department thought it was great and I should yeah. I don't know be the poster Sorry. child or something yeah, yeah. and from my end exam I made a music theater piece with three dancers and three singers and a seven-piece ensemble and three video screens that were connected to the three characters. So there was like 
the body of each character, the voice of each character, and then the video of each character, and then the seven-piece ensemble was being sent through a quadraphonic sound installation, and I was using <laughs> samples that was like fake live electronics. So recordings of all of those musicians that I had manipulated and then played at a specific point of the score to make it as if it had been sampled and played out live, because yeah. I had too many computers anyway running and I couldn't handle the, it yeah. was too much. And all of that for a thousand euro budget that I got from a <laughs> fund called the von Beilevelt Stichting. And I made that performance in the Melkweg Theater. Half the jury from the conservatory refused to come because they said, wow. your performance has to be in the conservatory for your end exam. You can't just go do it in some theater and expect us to come there. <laughs> and uh, the guys that did come, they gave me an eight. And uh, then I had two classes that I was supposed to finish and write some papers. And I said, I'm not going to do it. I did what I came here to do, and yeah. I'm not going to write those papers. And at the moment, I was in like basically a legal battle with the conservatory about my abuse of the right to use rehearsal spaces inside the school, and I had been stealing printer time. It's a very complicated, very ridiculous story. They revoked my right to have rehearsal spaces because I had been printing my score out of a printer, which was not allowed for students to use. Yeah. So anyway, I, that was that. I, I know those battles though, but the oh. thing is, like, after you leave it, yeah, it's a conservatory. <laughs> yeah, it's like a really small place, and the scene is it's, so much bigger. But when you're there, so true. It's, yeah, it's like, like your you. life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and that's also why the in the end of the diploma, I was like, you know what? I don't want to go back into that little microcosmos and fight with it just to get this piece of paper. Yeah. I, I also, got my paper. You got your paper. I did. I six think. months later. Yeah, I always six months later. That's yeah. my thing. But I got it. Yeah. Somehow. I wonder if it's ever going to come back to bite me in the ass. What? Not to make Not you... having a diploma. From, no. I mean, Nothing would said, come to bite It would be my me. only diploma for all the six years of school I did around the world. I would have one undergrad degree from the Amsterdam Conservatory <laughs> in <laughs> composition. Can't help me very much right now. <laughs> no. It's not going to get you a corporate job. Right? <laughs> That's for sure. I think. <laughs> Like, I did academic studies, right? <laughs> so I, we need to break this down, huh? Yeah, I guess yeah. it's time. Okay. Maybe we have one more cup of coffee. Your residency. Yeah, well, we... Yeah. Yeah. Today's, yeah, today's break down day. Tomorrow we have another show. Yeah, we now it's going to be uh, a bit of kind of sleeping on it and thinking yeah. about yeah. what the next steps will be. I to. think maybe like sometime next year, maybe around the spring again, Conversation. Yeah, that would be really great. Yeah, anyway, we would really appreciate to keep in touch and yeah. keep talking to you because yeah. that's yeah. been really You keep opening doors for us and fantastic. it's really, really special. Yeah. That would be great to have you guys, like, you know, part of the time sort of we love of artists as well. We would absolutely love yeah. it. It's like, it's great to have different styles and especially since you guys are so embedded yeah. in the scene in different areas. Yeah. Really sense yeah, I think support. I think we can also bring more people in and oh, definitely. In. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. People want to do residence because it's this town has this reputation that yeah. we're just kind of weird. Like, yeah, <laughs> in a good way. Yeah. But um, now we're totally open to all this stuff. That's great. Yeah, that's we'll really spread cool. the word. I mean, there's lots of people who are really interested in those things, mm -hmm. and I think That'd be cool. we can try and open a, a vortex for you guys. Vortex. <laughs> Actually, we should do we should do something because I'm I'm working with Henry Vega now on the yeah. CD project. Is it is it the one? Um, Warm song. I saw a video of the project with you and Iminami. That was Iminami. Okay. That was with, that we we were actually here rehearsing. Yeah, for the yeah, band. it looks really nice. Yeah, yeah it's it's, a, it's gorgeous. It's gonna be uh, next year in November music. Okay. Finally, we've been working on this project for five years. Oh, wow. We've been performing this for five years. It's crazy, oh, really? wow. and uh, and that's really mu like digital music theater uh -huh. with that projection. Was originally workshopped here. Yeah, it was workshopped here, and okay. we rehearsed here afterwards. But now we work on this CD project, which is quite popish and futuristic, okay. and. Uh, Actually, maybe we should, I don't know, maybe, how does it work with concerts? Can we pitch for you an idea for a concert? Yeah.